Good morning. I'm David Wessel. I'm director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. And uh, I'm joined this morning by Bill White, who, uh, unlike the man he ran against as for governor of Texas, can actually remember three things. Or we're going to see if you can remember exactly. three things. Uh, I don't think Rick Perry's written a book yet, has he? Uh, he did one about how great the Boy Scouts are. Ah. <laughs> Controversial. Yeah. Well, actually, it is controversial now. <laughs> uh, Bill White, of course, is now associated with Lazard, but he has a distinguished career in public policy, even though he doesn't like to call it that, uh, as Deputy Energy Secretary in the Clinton administration, and then, of course, as the mayor of Houston for as long as the Houston Charter lets you be mayor. Right? Exactly. Uh, but um, because you didn't have enough to do, you decided to write about the entire history of the U.S. Uh, fiscal situation in this wonderful new book. And um, well, I think I, this wasn't going to be my first question, but now that I, I ask myself, what in God's name of all the things you could write about, you've done so many different things in your life, led you to write about this topic? Well, I worried about it. Uh, and I think at least from now until the end of the, the last baby boomer retires in 2030, it's going to be the dominant issue. Uh, that overshadows so much of both domestic and foreign policy in the country. And then I was looking for a good book, uh, and several good books, and I didn't quite find that book. And of course, I wind up writing the book. <laughs> I see. So um, basically, this is a work of history. Mm -hmm. So when you look, of course, across more than two centuries of U.S. <laughs> policy on taxes and spending and debt, yeah. Um, what are the th two or three lessons that you draw that you think have relevance to us today? People manage to balance the budget to pay for routine expenses during normal times and still get reelected. That's one lesson. Uh, there's a widespread belief, you can hear about it, Dave, quite a bit in this town. Well, of course I know what's right, but you know, I can't get reelected, mm -hmm. or the party couldn't get reelected. People manage to match federal commitments with federal resources for most of the nation's history and borrowed only for extraordinary purposes. And so, <coughs> you know, I don't think people woke up in uh, December of 2000 or January of 2001 and decided they didn't care about the kids anymore or they wanted to be dependent on foreign creditors. I think there's still the possibility of aligning the federal commitments and resources and I wanted to tell the story about some heroes who did that. Mm -hmm. So, well, let, let me ask you about that. Who, who do you think are the big heroes in history, if you go all the way back to Madison and Gallatin and stuff like that? Well, you know, I like the, I like the early guys, in part, not simply because they're, you know, household names or icons, but because you sort of strip some of the issues bare of the clutter of the contemporary, you know, day-to-day -day debate, the tax extenders or the debt ceiling. Jefferson thought that we ought to have, to consider at least, a constitutional amendment so that you preserved opportunity for the next generation and you did not have a situation in which people disguised the current cost of government uh, and uh, resulted in more limited opportunities for the next generation. A constitutional amendment that would require basically everything to be expire after every yeah. 19 or 20 years. Well, you know, this is the problem. It, with all the constitutional amendment proposals is you can have a conception, but unless you can put it into words that are, you know, cast in stone in the form of a constitutional amendment, he, he thought there ought to be some dollar amount which is about the amount you could pay off in one generation. He didn't believe in defaulting on the debt, you know, from one generation to another. But he and Madison agreed that there would be principles that would be uh, clear enough to be visible to the eye of the ordinary politician about when this nation should borrow. Uh, and those principles were, it was deliberate. They came up with those principles. And all the uses of debt after, for, you know, 160 years, after 1820 were the same as they did between 1790 and 1820. In other words, they established the limits and principles for the proper use of federal debt early in the Republic. And they reflected the great values of the people at the time. 
that we wanted to make a better life for our kids that hey look uh, you didn't have a bunch of people with economics degrees in college uh, only a tiny percentage of the population even had a college degree but people understood that if you borrowed net money now you'd have to pay it back with interest later on down the line and somebody would have to pay that interest but I mean the the US what Jefferson imagined a much more agrarian society the federal government was minuscule then compared to what it is now. Uh, the revenue came from tariffs. They, they, the government benefits didn't even exist. So is, is the, are those lessons really relevant to where we are today? Well, first, uh, just as a point of fact, uh, you know, and this is not, it's just one of those things that people forget about. Uh, the government was not minuscule. Literally, the federal government, to a greater extent than today, owned, I'd say probably most of the wealth of the country. Why? Totally. It owned the land. Right. <laughs> and the great benefit program was the sale and often uh, subsidized sale. There were loan forgiveness, massive loan forgiveness since uh, 17, 1820, 1821. Uh, they even called the Relief Act uh, So back, back then. So the, the federal government has always been pretty big. Actually, its deposits the federal government's deposits were so large that they could make or break any financial institution in the country. Uh, it was it held a far larger percentage of hard current of the currency of the country than it does today. But the basic principle, you know, doesn't change. Uh, there's a book that's recently come out by a French economist, Thomas Piketty, that illustrates a very important point and and that point is that compound interest can be a wonderful thing for people who have money to invest in their creditors and there's a flip side of that it can be a very bad thing for people who are debtors uh, so uh, Jefferson like Piketty and many today Madison they were concerned about the issue of income inequality they believed that if you had a nation where the tax revenue was dedicated to debt service and couldn't provide public service, like education and infrastructure, it would be worse off, most Americans would be worse off. And strip bare that principle still applies today. Would we be better off today? Ask yourself, would we be better off today if all federal revenues, the entire federal budget, were for debt service? all other things being equal, or would it, we'd be better off if we could use that money for improvements that, that benefited the public as a whole. Doesn't it depend what you borrow the money for? Uh, in that circumstance I, I gave you, why you borrow the money is important, uh, but it would have to be borrow the money as opposed to tax, you see. And I can think of very few circumstances where it would be beneficial for us to have borrowed so much money that, as in the case in the early republic, uh, most of federal tax revenues went to pay debt. And this is why, during World War II, which involved a colossal federal commitment, the American people uh, understood, uh, in, in leaders in both parties, that you had to pay taxes. Uh, in 1945, the last year, in many ways, at the height of the mobilization uh, for World War II, tax revenues were covering the same percentage of the federal budget as they did just a few years back mm -hmm. in 2010. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push on that in a minute, but let's go yeah. back to the heroes. All right, yeah. so uh, Jefferson's a hero, but yeah. look, there's a lot of people in your book. A lot, a lot so of pick people. A couple, pick, pick a couple of others. Uh, <coughs> Albert Gallatin, here, imagine. Uh, 1793, somebody walks in, he's not poorly dressed, but they're not fancy dressed like most of the senators. He didn't run for the Senate. He talks with a heavy accent. French even. Uh, yeah, a heavy French accent. Uh, it's hard for people to understand what he says. He walks in. He has an place. excuse, unlike most of the people who talk. <laughs> he, 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 and and uh, he makes a motion almost as soon as he gets there. And the motion is that he wants to see, he wants to look at personally, the schedule of the interest payments and the debt service, when, when interest is due, what the expenses, itemized list of the expenses and revenues for the federal government for the last three years. 
It passes unanimously. People wonder what he's up to. Hamilton goes crazy. He says he's overworked. He views this as a sign of distrust that this member of Congress wants to look over the detailed ledgers of the federal government of the United States. The Senate kicks him out because he can't prove that he's a citizen. I mean, he doesn't want to prove that he's a citizen. Uh, it's all has a, a ring of familiarity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a citizen, but they didn't know who they were messing with because uh, this Albert Gallatin, you know, people they in the early republic, uh, or well, throughout both uh, UK, in UK and, and uh, the various colonies, they looked up to Voltaire and Rousseau as these icons, intellectual icons of the century. To Gallatin, they were family friends. He had graduated the top of his class at the top school on the planet Earth, uh, which was in Geneva, and he developed some principles that allowed us clear accounting, the use of trust funds to, with dedicated revenues, um, pay-to-go budget planning. These principles were used for the 12 years that he was Secretary of the Treasury to reduce debt, you know, balance the budget in normal circumstances. And the other one I mentioned is John Sherman. You know, this is a 19th century figure and is important because for current... So who is he? Tell us. Uh, tell, to imagine you're at the 1855 Republican Convention in you weren't Ohio. There? Yeah. <laughs> and really, it's not a Republican Convention at all. It's called the Anti-Nebraska Convention. And it has people who call themselves Anti-Nebraska Men. And they were just men. Uh, there, there were no-nothings or anti-immigration. There were people who were Whigs like John Sherman. There were various, uh, there, there were Democrats. There were free soilers. And this group got together to nominate a slate of people for state office who were opposed to the extension of slavery into the territories of the United States. Sherman presided over that. The whole nation was watching at the time because Ohio was the third largest state, the fastest growing state in the nation by far, the only one that hold, held its election for a governor in an off year, 1855. And at the end of the convention, Sherman manipulated his Whigs looked like they lost, but he got what he wanted, which was that the various people who were on that ballot had to agree to run and call themselves Republicans. He was as much a father of the Republican Party in this country as anybody else. But he thought that it was wrong to reduce taxes and finance that tax reduction with debt. He worked hard after the Civil War, where his more famous brother, William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, was such a brilliant general, to pay down the debt after the Civil War, because he and the early Republicans thought that it deserved this nation to allow people to have sacrificed their lives for the future of the country, and they're not to finish that job by paying down the debt after the Civil War. I think some people may find that a contrast to the opinions of some now. Right, right. I mean, as I recall the charts, Almost every war, we build up a lot of debt, and then it comes down relatively quickly afterwards. Mm -hmm. The Afghan-Iraq war seems to be an exception. It wasn't the only reason that we have a lot of debt, but it went up, and then it went up again during the Great Recession, and we don't seem to have figured out a way to bring it down. Yeah, and, and one <coughs> of the, let me point out, one of the things, after World War II, one of the things that was explicitly talked about is if you didn't, uh, if you, well, we, we went into surplus right after World War II. I mean, we cut federal spending severely. The economists all predicted that we'd go into a long-term severe recession when we cut spending. We didn't. Uh, which ought to give some... Right, but they, because they didn't, they didn't appreciate just all this pent-up demand in the economy. The returning with GIs and we'd had rationing, so they had all this savings. And it, it was both the, both the... They cut federal spending at a time that the economy, consumer demand, was really taking off. Uh, and investment. I mean, I, right. I could give you a number of different reasons, but I could say that on the case of like pent-up consumer demand, you could say today, well, we should have pent-up corporate demand with the cash on the balance sheets of right. American right. corporations. So it wasn't that there was something, you know, totally uh, unique, but there was this I I issue of some uh, pent-up demand. But we cut the budget right after that war in part, and here is a point, because People understood that we needed to use, that credit was precious. And if there was another war down the line, we needed to, to have that credit. Uh, today, according to CBO projections, uh, 
if you add up the cost of the uh, wars, the direct costs of the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan, the VA costs, and some of the other costs that are scattered throughout the federal government for uh, veterans-related benefit, plus the interest, plus the compounded interest on that interest. By 2020, we're going to be paying an interest expense for those wars, the same amount we did pay for the wars themselves in 2007, the height of the wars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any heroes in the 20th century? Yeah, I mean, you know, plenty of them. Uh, That's a really and, and uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I can take pairs that, you know, often in the 20th century they come in pairs, but some of the ones that I right. uh, concentrate on uh, throughout this narrative uh, are Truman and Taft uh, back after World War II. Clinton and Gingrich in the 1990s would be an interesting pair. All right, let's take and that one. Why do you say that? Well, uh, the balanced budget principle gave each of them a framework for having people within their own political parties make trade-offs between spending and taxes. So after the 1994 election, where there was still this impetus from Mr. Perot's initiative on the debt and presidential campaign in 1992, both President Clinton and Speaker Gingrich, who in 1995 was, as you remember, there was about nine months there where he was, he was as powerful as any speaker has ever been uh, in, in, in uh, Capitol Hill. And then they both agreed on the goal of balanced budget within their parties, both the president's budget and the budget that was proposed by the Republicans had to accommodate, you know, you had to, to make hard choices. And then after some battle, it, the, those choices framed the public debate concerning those trade-offs. It turned, there was a very specific trade-off. Nobody knew exactly the answer. It turns out that the public weighed in by the end of 1995 in favor of paying somewhat higher personal income taxes and preserving uh, the current structure of Medicare. But uh, it was uncertain until there was that crystallized debate concerning that trade-off uh, for the public. And they wind up, over the next several years, putting an agreement together with, that resulted in a balanced budget. And they, and they both deserve uh, credit for that. Um, now, if I read your book right, you think some, you see 2000, 2001 as a turning point, not yeah. in the right direction. So we have 200 years of American history and then we veer off in the wrong way? So, yeah. to be, well, right. so what happened? Uh, basically, the link between spending and tax policy is broken. Recall what you and I just talked about. The balanced budget principle aside from you know, its macroeconomic significance or its public finance significance, which is different than macroeconomic. How much money are you going to pay in debt service versus public services in the future? That's public finance significance. It has this normative, ethical, political science of you know, a society, what Paul Douglas, a senator, former economist, called the ethical dimension of a balanced budget, was making sure that your commitments match the people, the public's willingness to pay. When that link was broken in 2001, when each party had a spending policy and a tax policy, and there was little relationship between the two uh, p policies, uh, we've, we've been in that state ever since uh, So you're talking about we had, we, we came into the beginning of the decade with a surplus. Uh -huh. uh, turned out some of it was a bit, um, transitory, the result of a tech bubble that had produced a lot of capital gains. So that, the projections turned out to be overly optimistic. We had 9-11, which led us to spend money that we hadn't anticipated, and then the wars. And then we, as if that weren't enough, we compounded that with uh, a Medicare prescription drug benefit that had no visible means of support, just borrowed to pay for it. And debt finance tax cuts. Right. Now, uh, what happened to the Gallatin, Taft, Gingrich, Clinton, Bob Rubin, Dwight Eisenhower politics? You, you've argued, and other people have too, that um, good policy is good politics. And for generations, I mean, there's this wonderful uh, YouTube clip, which I, I recommend to you if you haven't seen it, of Everett Dirksen talking about the debt ceiling uh, with, in a way that 
Everett Durson was definitely not made for TV. You know, like he, he does the Rubio thing and takes a drink of water right in the middle of the thing. But it was made for radio. He definitely was made for radio. Well, maybe he was made for TV because he seems the most authentic and genuine. And he says, you know, if we just keep raising the debt ceiling a million dollars and a million, it seems like a lot of money. And then, but um, so what, how, how do you, why did the politics change? Is it, did the politicians change? Did the voters change? Is it the advent of Medicare and a whole era of entitlements in the great society? What, what's your analysis? Well, the first thing uh, I'll say is the politics shifted a bit on both parties in the past. If somebody, if one party had attempted to disguise the cost of government with debt and borrowed for routine operating expenses, the other party would have been all over them with a balanced budget plan. And the party who wandered from fiscal discipline would be concerned about its future viability at the polls. So one of the first lessons, and it was really a lesson they may have learned from uh, uh, the mid-1980s, when uh, you had uh, some borrowing and, and President Reagan was overwhelmingly reelected, but few people remember uh, the Democrats in Congress, I mean, in Congress, there was a big Democratic majority voted for Congress that year. So neither party at that time, in that, not in that particular election, there wasn't a sharp contest, in 1984 election, there wasn't a sharp contest over the debt. The Republicans went first and realized after what happened in 1995, 1997, that uh, the sort of smaller government, if they define that as the big things that government spent money on, defense and Medicare, for example, wasn't going to sell, so uh, might as well try to sell uh, you know, tax cuts as uh, smaller government. Well, that's ridiculous, of course. You don't reduce the size of government by cutting taxes, all you do is increase debt. You know, you make spending easier because now the cost of that spending is less visible to the people who are paying the price. And at that point, the Democrats had a choice of doing what President Clinton might have done, or uh, they chose to say that they were fighting and had succeeded in open quote saving, close quote, this and that program uh, because Tom DeLay basically, uh, you know, he wanted to get these appropriations to pass through. There's almost no dissent on appropriations for the six years at the beginning of the decade, starting in 2001, and appropriations sailed through Congress with almost no dissent. And uh, so that they said, well, we're able to get the, the programs that we value, and they, even though they were being uh, paid for in an unsustainable function. So in a way, both members of both parties were able to go to their primary voters now and, and claim that there was victory. But it was a hollow victory. A hollow victory because the lower taxes did not signify a smaller government. A hollow victory because the social safety net was financed on an unsustainable basis. And we're still at that point. We haven't changed very much. Yeah, we haven't changed very much. Now, let me just push a little bit on historical metaphors. Yeah. You can always pick one that works for whatever argument make. And there are people who argue that, yes, the debt, and particularly projections of the debt a decade or two out, are rather alarming, particularly since uh, debt relative to the size of the economy is much higher now than it was a decade ago, twice as high. Yeah. Um, but they say, and I, I don't think this is a caricature, be careful of your timing that this could be 1937, 1938. We could be in a position where the economy still hasn't fully recovered, and that uh, that we need we ha we need to avoid premature deficit reduction because it'll hurt the economy in the long run. We'll end up with more debt relative to GDP than we have now, and these are the people who found the sequester somewhere between outrageous and bizarre. So, are they wrong? Is this the wrong time to be cutting spending and raising taxes? now or are they right in, to the extent that they say don't do it now but make, de make decisions now to make yourself commitments to do this in the future? I, I don't see the, the, you know, I could get pretty technical. I do not see the parallel to 37, 38. I think you had, remember 
you did both have a contraction by the Federal Reserve, so you had a change of policy by the Federal Reserve. I think that somebody who you followed, and you wrote an excellent book, by the way, about uh, uh, Bernanke and the Fed, I think that the Fed, I mean, it's did a pretty good job uh, in the in the period of uh, 2000, you know, call it 2008, you know, after beginning right. of September of 2000, that, that one uh, Jackson Hole meeting. After that, uh, I think the Fed has done a pretty good job. It, the Treasury was trying to stem the flow. They, it was, it was uh, sanitizing the gold flow that was coming in from Europe right. and, and, and contracting the currency as well. So. I don't think really fiscal policy was uh, leading the charge on that. And when you look at the percentage of, of the government, I just don't think uh, that's quite plausible. We had not seen, I will say there's an analogy there, we hadn't seen a housing recovery. But I don't think how, how much you, you know, uh, how would I say it, how much you spend on uh, a military procurement program or this has a whole lot to do with the housing cycle. So I would say, uh, now is as good a time as any. If national income is at an all-time high, national income was not at an all-time high in 1937. National income is at an all-time high. Yes, there are some people who have not benefited from the growth in national income for the last 40 years. But borrowing, having the government borrow more money doesn't solve that problem. If that problem would have been solved uh, by the government borrowing money, you think it would have been solved between 2001 and 2010. Well, but if the economy is operating with a lot of slack, if there are a lot of unemployed people, surely it's not the best time to be doing instant tax cuts and instant, uh, instant tax increases and instant spending cuts. Well, I, mean, I, I don't know about that. Uh, that is to say, uh, if you borrow for wars and a severe downturn, and you look at math and economic history, when do you retire that debt? Only when unemployment is at 4.5 percent, uh, and why? Uh, moreover, as a, if you look at the elements of that, what that unemployment consists of, there are some issues on labor force mobility and where we are in revival of the construction cycle that to me are largely independent of whether we are borrowing money to pay for Medicare. Right, and, but what and, then, and then imagine dial forward in the future. <laughs> uh, suppose we do have an economic downturn that is severe economic downturn and we're using 45 or 50 percent of federal funds revenues to pay debt service because we didn't think that we could stop borrowing until unemployment reached 4.5 percent. And then finally, I'm going to say there's no scenario, no scenario that we have in which uh, if somebody said, okay, by 2020, we're going to balance the budget and this is, we're going to do it plausibly, assuming that we are going at 1.5% real growth per annum. I don't see any of those scenarios out there. Do you think that's all we can do? One, one and a half percent growth? Maybe two. Real, real growth. Right. It won't be out of line with, you know, Dave, when... There's little, little net growth in the working age population seeking work then. And in Europe, that population, Europe, Japan, Korea, that population net is declining. Uh, there, we, we could be in for an era of slow growth. All right, but if I came to you and said, look, uh, for a number of reasons, some of them uh, good, some of them bad. The federal government can borrow money for 10 years at something like 2.5% now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's hard to argue that we've overdone, we're not like the Chinese, we haven't overdone it on infrastructure spending. And we have a lot of um, unemployed construction workers. Doesn't it, if I told you I want to borrow another $100 billion to fix airports and, or build broadband networks or repair bridges, which will pay off in the future in terms of more productivity. Isn't that qualitatively different than saying, I want to borrow another $100 billion because I don't want to raise taxes to pay the salaries of today's employees or today's Medicare beneficiaries? Isn't there a big difference between those two options? Sure. And, and, but, but let me just say, the way 
if, if somebody, this comes up time and time again from people who I can always consider myself progressive, from progressives, yo, do, don't you believe that there are investments for the future, et cetera? Yes, but you know, uh, there was a qualification in what you said. You said an extra. Mm -hmm. This year, we're going to be borrowing about $700 billion in the federal funds budget, the federal spending and revenues apart from the trust funds, dedicated trust funds. So if somebody's saying, well, I mean, first of all, it would just be a complete fabrication and myth uh, to think that a significant portion of that, or certainly an earmark, was in education and infrastructure. If we want to, and then there's something else about infrastructure. And that is, in business, if you borrow money every year in maybe a somewhat increasing amount consistently every year, then the case for doing that with capital spending with debt is less than it is than if it's an extraordinary expense. And something else with business, on the business analogy. A business, if it did use debt every year to finance that capital expenditure, then the rationale for its doing so is it's going to capture the full benefit of that capital expenditure in its revenues going down the line. And it will be able to contain the debt by paying down the debt. Public finance, what a lot of people, this is just a point, but it's important. These infrastructure projects are not designed, they could have a high social return on investment, but that doesn't mean that they're going to pay for themselves with increased tax revenue in the future. Why is that? The reason is that we don't tax, you know, 90% of the, of the economic growth of the country. Our effective tax rate is just a small percentage of the increase in, in the net income of the country resulting from a capital project. Let me put it another way. Let's say that you build a bridge and the bridge more than pays for itself has a high social return on investment, but that doesn't mean that it generates the, the revenues to the federal government that can pay for for the debt service on that bridge. And, and, and but what's wrong with b making investments that have a high social return on investments? I mean, Abraham Lincoln did the I land. I agree completely. And so I say, go to the next, what's wrong with paying taxes to do so? Right. Now, when that's, you, that's my when point. You, you, you propose thinking about the f federal budget differently, and I completely agree with you that the way we think about the budget in the grossest terms, in the most simplistic terms, has a big uh, effect on the policy. I mean, you can just see the politicians scurrying around to prevent the SSDI, the Social Security Disability Trust Fund, from running out of money as if that's kind of the problem as opposed to the problem being the problem. Exactly. But I was intrigued that you think that we ought to divide the budget into what you call the federal funds thing, which is the taxes that come in, the spending goes out for today's operations, and then the trust funds, which are dedicated taxes for things like Social Security and Medicare. But you don't do it, and my question earlier implied, uh, that we ought to think about operating and capital. And it's okay to borrow for capital needs, but not okay to borrow for operating needs. Why is that? Uh, oh, it probably add about 10 pages to the book, and it was getting a, a small long. percentage. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I, and when I served in the administration back in 93 and 94, I, I think there's merit to a capital budget. I think cities and states have capital budgets. I will say that uh, uh, one of the reasons why cities and states, uh, the debt for cities and states has gone at only half the federal level in the last 40 years is that they have a mechanism by way by which you can enforce that, and that is they have, you know, bond issues that mm -hmm. are approved by the voters that identify the capital projects by uh, by source, and then, including many progressives, you get many progressives who are saying uh, that uh, I would say it, that they call almost everything an in, in investment, right? Whatever it may be, your foreign it, investment. Yeah, they're, they're the the the. the Consultant told them that people like investments but not spending, so they call everything investment. Okay. Uh, and then finally, I've talked to a lot of people about, I won't do it right here and bore everybody that's watching us, about the capital budget. Actually, the, the Congress passed a law. There is a capital budget. You can find it in budget documents on the White House website. And... Uh, 
very few people understand uh, what's in there. And then what do you do, how do you treat military procurement within that? Mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, so basically your, the point is, great in concept, but once you try to implement it, you end up with a whole lot of thorny issues that prevent you from ever reaching the benefits of the concept. And moreover, moreover, real capital expenditures that would have a social ROE that would be analogous to the historical borrowing we did for the Union Pacific Railway, for the Panama right. Canal would be examples where we used debt right. well in the past. Those as a percentage of the overall budget of the United States, our spending in the United States are, are very small. Right, but I think that's a problem, not yeah. an excuse for. I, 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 I would agree with you, but I go back to my point. If, if the point is, well, listen, people wouldn't want to, you know, people are so ignorant that they wouldn't want to pay for that stuff with taxes, even though they ought to, so let's do it with debt. I think we ought to make the case that people ought to pay taxes. No, I don't, I don't think that's there. I think the argument is that it's easy to explain to people that we ought to, in, when, when the economy is operating normally, we're not mm -hmm. running the worst depression since the Great Depression, uh, we should raise enough money in taxes to pay the operating expenses of the government and the benefits we're paying to people today so that you shouldn't be borrowing to pay Medicare to my parents, I now, got it, right? Yeah. Yep. But that um, just as, and I'm actually, I, I say this with some hesitation because I'm basically allergic to the family metaphor because it leads I, you to some stupid things, yeah. but just as it, it doesn't make sense to use your credit card to buy groceries, that is to borrow to buy groceries, but it may make sense to borrow money to, for, a, to, for a house or to pay for your college education. We could, we, if we had a principle that we raise enough money in taxes to pay for operating expenses in today's consumption, today's benefits, but we borrowed for things that investments with all your caveats about how we'll define everything in investment yeah. then. That doesn't seem like anything wrong with that. Not, not at all. And actually that's the way uh, cities and states do their right. business. Right, right. And, 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 when <coughs> they, and when there was a loophole on that because of the, uh, uh, the, the unreported uh, or the unfunded pension liabilities, they, right. they try, drove through that loophole. But in general, right. the, the principle that cities and states apply is you pay for operating expenses right. and then you can borrow for capital expenditures with voter approval when it's explicitly discussed. Isn't part of the problem we have now that um, it's not, we're, we're doing, oh, we're not having any problem raising money now. We, we seem to be able to borrow almost unlimited amounts of money, although much of it comes from abroad. Uh, we can't count on that going on in the future. As you point out, the debt has gotten very big uh, and we're not fighting a war m anymore and so it doesn't give us much headroom if we want to go up again. Right. But that the, the, if you look forward a decade or two, a lot of this has to do with what the trajectory of healthcare costs are. Exactly. Because so much of that is paid by the federal government and we have so many people, uh, 10,000 a day, crossing the threshold and becoming eligible to Medicare. Wh what do you think would be the best way to get a grip on that now? What would you do either so we have enough revenues to pay for future health care spending or we have lower growth of health care spending? Uh, and that's probably the most important, que astute question, most important. And I could add on, if I could just uh, highlight that question. I don't care where you fall on the political spectrum. The fact that debt service costs and medical services are rising at so much faster than national income and are scheduled to rise so much faster than national income uh, for the next, you know, for a long, long time. Means that, you know, the traditional conservative form, well, let's just cut taxes or, or, the, or, you know, let's preserve or expand domestic programs. Those things are be, gonna be squeezed out of the political dialogue and the debate. But the first thing to do is to have a national discussion of what I call pay-as-you-go Medicare. Uh, Medicare was never intended to be debt financed. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to add an extra level of interest onto medical bills that are going up fast enough. That makes no sense. It makes no sense for a generation that has fewer medical needs, or today we have fewer medical needs, than we will uh, in 2030, where the number of people over 85 is more than double what it is today as we're sitting here right now. 
Uh, that's the opposite of insurance. Insurance is taking risk and, and shifting it from uh, uh, the risk from a population with greater medical needs to a healthier population, not vice versa. The American people support the concept of Medicare. They're suspicious about the use of government funds. If we put money into a trust fund and it could be used only for that purpose in the past, people have felt more comfortable, I as a taxpayer would feel more comfortable than when it went into what people, with some would consider uh, a black box where you didn't know where the money ever went. And finally, the Medicare tax itself is the broadest base tax of all. There's no deductions, no credits, it covers more of GDP than anything else. So I think that, that uh, a place to start would be how do we pay for Medicare? And for those people who believe, as I do, that there needs to be reforms to bring down that cost curve. There's no better place to start than assigning a price to medical services in the form of taxation that people can see. Uh, simply sweeping the tough choices uh, under the rug with the use of debt is unacceptable. And we'll have an adult conversation concerning high cost procedures, high cost patients, uh, ways to enhance the efficiency and delivery of medical care if there are conse financial consequences. If people just think it's somebody who wants to have a death panel because they want the government meddling in the lives, then we're going to have a hard time making progress. Right, right. Yeah, the prospects for an adult conversation on health care seem that uh, I wouldn't sign, wouldn't particularly invest my IRA on that, uh, yeah. on that thing. But basically what you're saying is if we ident had an identified tax for Medicare, and it rose with Medicare spending, that would probably be the best way to force reform of the system because people would say, holy cow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before we turn to questions, let me ask you one other thing about, so you had some experience in the energy department, and I wonder if you think there's some kind of win-win compromise that could deal with the mounting debt that we face, inadequate revenues to, to pay our bills, and the global warming question. Is there, is, do you imagine some day in the, in the foreseeable future while you and I are still alive where somehow a carbon tax descends from somewhere and becomes a solution to more than one problem? Uh, yes. Good. Uh, so, uh, I should stop you there because yeah. every other thing you say, yes, I'm optimistic, but, and then you make me depressed. So, yeah, no, no, but, I, so I, how did that happen? Well, I, I think that, uh, I mean, this is one of the ironies of the political system that uh, much of the energy business, who people have a stereotype as, you know, you know, it's the bad guys in popular movies on, on this issue, uh, think that there should be a carbon tax if that's uh, administered, that's imposed and administered and it's predictable in advance. As a matter of fact, uh, Exxon has a, you know, at the beginning of the year, a global forecast for the next 20, 30 years of global energy needs. And in order to do that, they assume there is a carbon tax that is imposed because they think that if the world is serious about this problem and there's enough evidence we ought to be, that sooner or later we're going to have a carbon tax imposed. One problem that you have, quite frankly, is this, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Grover Norquist and these people who've hijacked the idea that paying for government with debt is conservative. Uh, and it's not. So uh, once you get past that, uh, conservatives traditionally have favored consumption taxes rather than taxes on investment and productivity, and a carbon tax would be one means for, to get there. This is why that this was considered uh, an energy tax by George H.W. Bush and uh, their, you know, debates in uh, 1989, 1990. Reminds me of what Larry Summers once said about the VAT, when the, when the conservatives realize it's regressive and the Democrats realize it's a money machine, then we'll get a, a carbon <laughs> tax. Uh, uh, I think we have time for questions, and there's a microphone. Why don't you, if you have one, why don't you take the mic and tell us who you are? Thank you, uh, Mort Downey, transportation consultant. Bill, you know I care about infrastructure. Yes. Uh, and you've talked about it a bit, but we're facing at this point 
the highway trust fund actually literally going broke in yep. July. Yep. Nobody seems to have an idea what to do about it. We've thrown general fund borrowing into it for years. We talked a bit about a capital budget. Yep. We talked a bit about maybe stronger trust funds. Yep. How about user fees that are more responsive to what's being used? And then another idea, much of what we spend is actually just fixing what we have. Could we put depreciation into the general budget and try to cover that? Uh, and uh, the gentleman asking the question, by the way, Dave, is one of the most knowledgeable people in transportation in the whole country. He served as Deputy Secretary of Transportation when I, in the Clinton administration. I would say, first, that the public has always understood some of the benefits of infrastructure. Our budget problems are not caused by excessive spending on infrastructure in the United States at, at, at all levels. This is one reason, you know, Dave, where I was a little concerned that some people I talked to have the impression that there's a lot of money being spent on infrastructure where there's not. So it's almost, I won't say a rounding error in the budget, but it is a very small percentage. I think the use of trust funds for infrastructure paid for user fees is something that has a good idea. Uh, you know, President Reagan, uh, as you well know, in 1982, when there was a large deficit that appeared, one of the first things that they did was to raise the tax on motor fuels and put it in the transportation trust fund. I think those people who equate uh, small government with government on the installment plan uh, the no tax anywhere, anytime people are short-sighted in, in uh, opposing taxes on, on uh, motor fuels that could go in, into and in, in revive the highway fund. And I think that if it was explained, listen, I was mayor of a big, I was mayor of a city that's bigger than 15 states. I would just talk to people back and forth. We had transportation needs within the city of Houston about at the budget, and people were willing to pay for transportation improvements if you told them what the money was going to be spent for. But I think that the problem is that when the conversation becomes overly simplistic and the only thing that matters is the debt, that it, it has led to a, a situation where we're um, naive about how we cut spending, that it does matter what spending you cut and it does matter what taxes you raise, and the, if the only objective is fix the debt, you may end up doing that by cutting the already small infrastructure spending even more, unless you kind of emphasize to people that really does matter where you cut spending. And what I've tried to do in the book is <coughs> to avoid the idea, first of all, I agree with you, and I think we have about two votes. And so what I really want to do is say, Three if we're creative. You know, three, three <laughs> if we're, maybe in South Texas in the old days. But, but uh, what I, what, what I want to say is, uh, you know, I think the American people come out about the right way, and just like people in my community, if you went back and forth. And I think too many people who are in Congress, which is the only branch of government that has the ability to do tax and spend, uh, think that, well, I'm all for reducing the debt, but only if it's done my way. Right. Over time, there's going to be pressures and there's other sources of funding besides the federal government, by the way, for infrastructure. And we'll come up with a, the balance. Sir? Uh, James saying, this is a kind of funny question. Uh, yeah. About history, you talk about the good old days and pointed out that, of course, in the good old days, the U.S. had lots of land, so it sold land to finance uh, infrastructure and stuff like that. And I wonder if you could talk about a little bit more. I mean, the development crowd, as they look at uh, developing countries, are very much into doing national counting, where, for example, uh, non-renewable resources as they're exploited get, show up on the balance sheet. And uh, so what, was the 19th century where we had lots of land and sold, sold that land to pay for things really that an analogous situation? to what, where we are now, and if it, we use modern accounting standards, would we have been running a deficit then? Uh, would we have been, let me, let me say, it was off the balance sheet financing, and then how you account for the opportunity cost for that land. 
uh, but I don't think, how would I say it? I'm dealing, maybe, maybe I ought to deal with everything on the planet Earth uh, and all the social problems, but I'm concerned in the book with one thing. How do we have sustainable financing of the United States in light of the fact that there's a limit on the amount of taxes that the American people think the government at all levels should take. So I'm focused on that. But uh, is a lesson that, that there is a myth, and I think your question points it out, that in, in the uh, 19th century, uh, the federal government was a whole lot bigger than a lot of people give it credit for. And actually, if you go back there, uh, people considered the federal government an absolute monolith compared to the cities and states, or for that matter, private enterprise. Uh, I was hoping that's responsive. Move to the back. Uh, hi, thanks. This is fascinating. I was hoping you could kind of tell us who you are. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris Leonard. I'm a fellow at New America, yeah. and um, I was hoping you could help me understand what seems to be kind of a contradiction in that you hear a lot of statements that our debt is on an unsustainable path, yeah. but in the market, it's priced at a level that would make you think there's no way we will default. Yes. And this seems like an absolute disconnect. I was wondering if you could help me understand why and then maybe where that's headed. Will this resolve somehow? Okay. And I'm going to give you a precise answer that's significant, but it's not a sound bite because reality is a little complex. What is, I don't think we're going to default, first of all. Uh, I think there's a tremendous global demand for the dollar and people will you know want to have some interest rate on those dollars even if they short term e even if it's a low and a short term interest rate i think with the maturity of the population the aging of the population here and in the rest of the world that you're going to see a savings rate that higher that was higher than it was at times in the last 40 years which will contribute to the demand for treasuries and suppress interest rates. Having said all that, I'll tell you what's unsustainable. What's unsustainable is that if, according to the CBO, next seven years, that the debt service goes up from, you know, say, 24% uh, of all the revenues that the federal government receives outside of trust funds to 45% of all the revenues it receives outside of the trust funds. They get this, you'll have less money to spend for everything else. Yeah, I mean, that, that may seem pretty no, that radical, may, but. That, but that, <laughs> that, 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 that's too circular. Yeah. So the CBO yeah. assumes that interest rates will go up, Yes. right? Yeah. And there is something that's a bit puzzling. If we're led to believe that financial markets are forward-looking, yeah. and you're telling us that the U.S. government, the world's largest corporation, is yeah. running an unsustainable debt policy, yeah. one would expect that one of these days the market would be unwilling to lend money at 2.5% for 10 years. And the fact that it's as low as it is and has stayed as low as it is, you would agree, I hope, is a bit of a puzzle. I mean, so ever since the beginning of the year, Long rates have been coming down, even though the Feds are buying fewer, uh, the Federal Reserve is buying fewer bonds. So there is something jarring about the 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 statement you make, which is true, which is we seem to be on an unsustainable course, and the supposedly forward-looking financial markets, which seem to be coming to a different conclusion. Yep. So I was it, that's a great. I I was defining sustainability as. Uh, if debt service is going to consume, and I'll get back to the point on interest rates, a higher and higher percentage of the uh, revenues that, the federal funds revenues, fe revenues outside of trust funds, there'll be less of those revenues to pay for everything. Right. And so the current level of spending, <laughs> that is not sustainable. The current level, we can't, moreover, I'd say on interest rates, just a comment, uh, that you have several things going on. First is that, uh, uh, you know, you have had a l massive amounts of purchasing of bonds uh, by the Federal Reserve. I do not think, if you look at the, you know, state policy of the Chinese 
government and the central bank that you'll see the same level of purchasing by the Chinese of the of treasuries that you have uh, had in the past. And so when you combine those two things and even a slowly growing uh, uh, recovery, I think my, my point was based on a rise in the average uh, treasury weighted average of, to 4.5% uh, from the level it is today, which is in line with the historical average. But I don't think you have an interest rate spike. Put another way is when I say unsustainable, I don't think, I'm not saying go buy gold and we're going to default on our debt. Uh, I think that the, the great availability of credit has been a great enabler of our, you know, disguising the cost of government with debt. I think it will continue to enable that cost to be disguised for a while. Uh, but there will be a consequence, and that is that there's going to be less and less tax revenue to spend right. for everything else. So let me, let me, I think I got this right. Let me summarize it three ways. Yeah. One is, this isn't a point you'll make, but I'll make it is, um, the markets are not so good at looking forward as they pretend. Okay. That they could change their mind in a hurry. We they could that. change their mind in a hurry. Secondly, it's gonna, the problem is not that we, a, a big problem is that interest on the debt and debt service will crowd out spending on other things. And the more we run these, these big deficits, the more of our federal spending will go to pay interest on the debt, half of which goes to the Chinese and the Japanese. And we won't have money for the things you value no matter what it is those things you value, the government does, whether it's defense Absolutely. or bridges. And third, um, counting on the Chinese continuing to save enormous amounts of money and using it to buy treasuries doesn't seem to be a great long-run strategy for a great country like that. Moral, and, and that the only way that the, some of the easy way outs are to continue to borrow more than you're paying for interest, and then you're running a race against compound interest, and you will never win in that race. Right. Uh, I think there was one uh, up front, and then. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Larry Chargino. I'm a management consultant. Uh, your uh, your history of uh, this perspective on this, I think, is really fascinating, and that's the the source of my question. We're now a century into uh, this love hate relationship with the federal income tax yeah. as a national value. Um, is that a real turning point in, in the subject you're discussing here today, or is that just a, a blip on the radar? Are, are, is consumption tax and, and other sources of revenue, debt, for example, that you were just discussing, are those more important to the American psyche, or are they more troublesome? Or where do we, where do we come down on, on financing the federal government in your, your historical view? Uh, well, I'll make two points, and I hope these are responsive, but maybe they have some contemporary significance. Uh, and you're going to have to buy the book to, to get the, co the complete answer. And don't, and they have to, and don't borrow to buy it either. And, and, that they have, uh, and they have to do with tax reform, okay? I think that tax reform that results in a net rise in revenue is unlikely and can be, and the prospect of which can be somewhere between a deception and a mirage. Uh, and there's various reasons for that. But I will just say, think about it now. 2012, you had the Republican presidential nominee saying that he was going to raise federal revenues through tax reform and help close the budget gap that way. And right now, the Senate is considering a bill, if they were to adopt a House bill, the revenue loss from the perpetuation of certain tax breaks would fully offset, over a 10-year period, the revenue gains from the raise in income tax on the top 1%. So, you know, the tax reform is an election year talk. Number two is that the income tax system we have, one reason why it's clumsy, why it's complex, why there's tax lawyers, is it's really almost a hybrid of an income and consumption tax. If you had an income tax where you said, you take your income, you subtract your savings, and then we're gonna tax that, you'd come out mathematically the same place you would with a consumption tax. Uh, 
And so we really have a hybrid between the two systems right now. And uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think it, it's, it's the balance that all those tax laws have been signed by a president elected by the people and enacted by Congress with, with both people. We, we, the tax laws are complex because they try to have a balance. But don't you think that the, um, the constituency for consumption taxes seems to be limited to uh, academics and tax reformers and that in general it doesn't seem like the people are ready to trade the income tax for something else? Yep. Yeah. Sir? Uh, Mark Trumbull with the Christian Science Monitor. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear, as someone who's uh, been involved in city government uh, as well as federal, how much of the, uh, how much do we have a big fiscal problem with uh, things like unfunded pension liabilities and other uh, obligations and needs of cities and states, and how does that factor into your big picture of where America stands? Could we? Uh, does, it, does that make the problem a lot bigger in scope? And, and uh, could we be headed toward a situation where some states and cities do a lot better or worse than others? Uh, well, the, the last point is uh, absolutely uh, that uh, the cities that have, uh, have to spend much of their personnel costs on people who are no longer delivering services uh, are going to be at a competitive disadvantage <laughs> to those jurisdictions that can use their tax revenues to pay for services that are currently being delivered. And that's why the, uh, how would I say it, uh, I'm a pretty progressive person. Within five months of being elected a mayor, I had a citywide referendum in the nation's fourth largest city on pension reform. And I was attacked by the unions and people who said it was, uh, you wouldn't believe. Uh, uh, there, there was a lot of vilification. But I got 73% of the people endorsed what I have to say. Now, in our state, like most states, like most states, uh, the uh, state legislatures are the ones that really write the rules governing what the level. I had to put it on the referendum so that I could put the you know, fear God into people and let people know that the public was on our side. It wasn't vilifying our city employees. I had TV commercials that said, hey, uh, I want to pay people more to work well and less not to work. That was my commercial and I think people, that's what my intention was. And that's what I did. So, but I think it's a serious issue and, and uh, it highlights the fact that you need to have clean and honest accounting of accrued liabilities. Now, the worst offender of this accrued liability of all is the federal government because when they get that Medicare premium and they get that payroll tax, at least the cities have pension funds that uh, record that accrued liabilities, but you don't find it much in the unified budget. You've got to go to the Medicare trustees report to figure out what the accrued liability is. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Steve Levine with yeah. New America. B Bill, I'm, I'm interested also in the historical part of their book, and I'm, I'm wondering about your sense of the, of the dynamics of history. So you make the case that in, in, in the book that Americans have, a certain, have had a certain tradition th through history. It's changed since 2001. Right. So I'm wondering about uh, how much is history uh, an animating force in itself, in what we're going to see in the in the future here, and, and it just makes sense, makes logical sense that the debate that you're describing must have happened before in our in our history too. You know, uh, Churchill says something along the lines of the father you look back, the father you can see into the future, and so that's the purpose for what I, uh, uh, you know, wrote the book. And and I would say one thing I did learn is that if there is some candidates in one party or the other who has a realistic plan to balance a budget and not necessarily one fiscal year in response to year, but uh, 
not overnight, but within a re, you know, five years, four years, seven years, front end loaded, but not doing it all at once. And, and it plausible. Who's talking to the American people like this, or like I did with town hall meetings within the city, and other mayors do uh, within their cities? That uh, the incumbents have something to fear. That um, the American people understand that there's no such thing as free, and that in the past that people can get reelected using common sense uh, fiscal principles. If neither party fears competition from a balanced budget for the other party, if they're competing as they were a few years ago when Ryan had a plan to balance the budget in 40 years and attacking the White House for having a plan that you know, wouldn't balance for 50 or 60 years, well, there's real no competition on the issue. That's a joke. But if you have people who, like Mr. Pro did in 1992, or you have other times in American history, uh, offer a balanced budget plan, then I think you'll see uh, some support increase for those. Do you think there's a chance that the reason we wanted to borrow so much is that the economy slowed and particularly the growth of incomes in the middle class slowed and borrowing everything from home equity loans to the federal government was kind of some sort of response to not wanting to live within our means because that would have required living with slower growth? Well, you know, I'm not uh, we've had slow growth uh, since the 1970s, uh, you know, uh, twice, three times. Uh, actually, uh, Congress came very close to passing a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Voters overwhelmingly uh, say they support a balanced budget. We uh, brought the, the budget so, sort of into balance in, towards the end of the 1990s where uh, actually, during the 1990s, the growth in high income was extraordinary compared to everybody else. So, and then you looked in the 19th century, between you know 1790 and call it uh, the 1920s, and now there's more series. Actually, real wages in the United States did not grow up, did not grow uh, all that much. You've had that. Uh, there, there was great in for a hundred years. There's been a problem of income inequality. After World War, during, during the Great Depression, uh, well, I, I'll leave it at that. I, th I think that, no. I think what happened recently is that there were, each party had a spending policy and a tax policy, and the two didn't meet. Now, would it be nice to think that things were free? Yes. On that note, I think we'll cl call this to a close. Bill, thanks for Thank writing you. the book and for coming here today, and thanks to all of you for participating. Thank you.